to you from I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri country and I wanted to acknowledge that this land is Aboriginal land and sovereignty was never ceded and pay my respects to elders past and present um, and if you're interested you may wish to put the land in which you're located and coming to us from in the chat if you're keen um, but yeah it's very important that we acknowledge that there were people in this country before um, white settlement and acknowledge their ongoing custodianship of the land. So now that's done, I just wanted to start um, by explaining a bit about Digital Rights Watch if you're not familiar with us already. Um, we formed a few years ago and our vision is to ensure fairness, freedoms and fundamental rights for all people who engage in the digital world. And we obviously have a focus on Australia, which is where we're located. Um, and we've been working for the last 18 months on this project, which we're, we're launching a report that's come out of it today. Uh, so the scene for this particular project is looking at the changing internet economy. And I was reflecting on that before, um, before this event and thinking about how the promise of Web 1.0 was, um, was very emancipatory. It was about peer-to-peer -peer connections, about building networks that were flat, that allowed people to communicate, to collaborate, to make content together. And that in more recent times, that vision uh, has started to deteriorate as we've seen the centralization of power in key tech companies, and particularly around how we engage socially, um, but also then how content is created and shared and the economy of that kind of social connection being centralized in major technology platforms. And this has been a source of uh, despair, disappointment for a lot of people uh, who had perhaps the, the original vision of Web 1.0, but also I think for a whole new generation of people who've come into the online age uh, with these tech platforms being the backdrop to their online existence and seeing the limitations of those platforms and that centralization of power, not just for their own social life, for their own consumption of cultural content, but also for our democracy. And that's the general backdrop for this particular project. Um, but perhaps more specifically, there's also been a, um, a move among regulators to push back against this centralization of power. And we've seen initiatives from around the world looking at uh, addressing this problem and trying to um, deal with the consequences of centralization of power in tech platforms. And Australia is one such place. And in fact, we're making a name for ourselves internationally for experimenting with this kind of regulation. And probably the most relevant example of this for the purposes of this project has been the News Media Bargaining Code. Um, that code was introduced uh, or tabled as a bill around the time this project started about 18 months ago, and it was causing a lot of controversy. Uh, and we were certainly critics of it at Digital Rights Watch. We were concerned about how it didn't address the fundamental inequalities of the digital economy, and actually, in fact, sent uh, further entrenched power between platforms and media organisations who may now have an interest in not necessarily interrogating that power. And we wanted to talk about how we could uh, rebalance the internet economy so that it worked for everyday people, um, so that it worked for people who were making content, who were organizing, who were exploring their creativity and their personalities online and wanted the freedom to do that without uh, surveillance yeah. capitalism and without regulation that favored the status quo over the rights of individuals. And that's been the shadow in which this project has emerged. Um, but it's also been really illuminating, I think, because it's shaped how we've tried to, to talk about alternatives to what we currently have uh, in the context of regulation that isn't doing the job well. So if we are going to go into a period of um, active regulation of online life, we want it to be good regulation, we want it to be rights respecting, and that's the motivation of the organisation. And this example of the News Media Bargaining Code, I think, encapsulated that quite well and was a great um, context for, in, for us to do this kind of work. And um, it allows then the voices of people who are genuinely affected by big decisions made by governments and tech platforms to have a say, to talk about their experiences of online life, of creating content online, of um, building communities and organizing in online spaces. And uh, this kind of research is not going to be done by other institutions, including I don't think mainstream media, but of course not 
tech platforms either. And it's, uh, it's an important part of the discussion that needs to be present in the context of discussions about regulation. Uh, so I wanted to, to just give you that context and then um, hand over to Sam and James. Uh, but I do just want to acknowledge a few things before I do. Um, this report has been a huge amount of work that's been done by a number of people in our organisation, um, most obviously Sam Floriani and James um, Clark, who are our staff members who've been great, but I also want to acknowledge Lucy, who was our previous uh, executive director, who um, unfortunately left us, but is still on our board, um, but she left us as a staff member um, about halfway through this project and put a huge amount of work into it. Uh, and then other board members who've contributed it a considerable amount, including Lily um, Ryan, who's here today. But I, I did want to acknowledge the hard work that's done by all of the people who I just mentioned, who um, have a real passion for this work, have a real passion for the idea of human rights in online spaces, and are prepared to do the work to make that happen. And um, I, I'm always impressed by their passion, commitment and professionalism. And then I also wanted to thank the Internet Society for funding this work. Uh, I think it's very visionary for a foundation to do that kind of funding, uh, to give us the space to explore these kinds of questions um, and, uh, and the resources to be able to do it well uh, so that it can um, provide an intervention into these policy debates that's meaningful, that's based in, um, in clear and considered reflective reasoning based on evidence and that kind of freedom to do that work wouldn't be possible without the foresight of a funder like the Internet Society so we're extremely grateful for that support um, and we're really proud of the work that we do coming out of that um, funding but it, it wouldn't be possible uh, I think it's fair to say without um, leadership from a foundation like the Internet Society so we are very grateful and thank you very much for that um, but I'll now hand over to Sam to talk more about the report itself. Brilliant. Thanks for that introduction, uh, Lizzie. I feel like you really set the scene well there. So to I'm trying to, here we go. Nope. There we go. Okay. So to kick things off, I really want, I wanted to start with this quote from um, Rebecca Giblin, who is a professor, because I feel like it really sort of gets to the heart of a lot of the issues that we um, were focusing on in this project. So Throughout the course of this project, we spoke to a lot of people and there was this real sense of frustration that came through. And that was really based on this sense of like, well, did it, these digital plat platforms would essentially be nothing if they weren't populated with the culture and content and creativity and communities uh, that, people, that people share and populate them with. And so as Re Rebecca highlights here, uh, this is what makes these platforms profitable. It what, it's what makes them powerful. And yet the people who are providing this kind of content and creativity and culture are not getting a fair deal. And so there was this really strong sense of unfairness um, and power imbalances that came came through throughout this project. Um, so we really wanted to like look into this issue more deeply and and really like um, explore the experiences and the perspectives of the people who are doing this kind of creative uh, knowledge and community based work. So the project itself, what we did is we, we wanted to host a bunch of conversations and hear from people to develop this kind of grassroots narrative about the ways that uh, digital platforms are working for people, because of course there are positives. There are, there are many ways that, um, th that these platforms can benefit people. Some of them included things like, you know, increased reach or increased connectivity with all kinds of different communities, um, you know, without the limitation of, of uh, geography. Um, but this always came with a really strong but. We would hear from people being like, yes, you know, there's all these amazing things that I can do, but, and then they would list all of the vast um, challenges and negatives and um, harmful things that were occurring as a result of the power of digital platforms at the same time. So we heard from over 300 people over the course of this project. Uh, and in particular, we wanted to hear from artists, musicians, writers, sex workers, activists, and community organizers. Because uh, they have all experienced really big fundamental shifts in the way that they're able to work um, and make an income um, as platforms have disrupted their industries. 
We conducted these conversations over four town hall style events where participants were able to speak with each other as well as respond to comments and questions from the broader community. We grouped these events into four different themes. So exhibit, imagine, gather and create. Um, and we grouped them around sort of different pockets of communities and different issues that they face, which I'll get into a little bit more detail in a minute. Alongside this, we also ran a community uh, survey online and we wanted to do this to sort of expand the scope of the, the voices and perspectives that we were able to hear from, um, a, you know, who are experiencing similar, similar issues and broadly we found that the responses in the community survey reflected many of the themes and challenges that that were coming out in these town hall events um as i said we wanted to, to develop this grassroots narrative on ways that they're working ways that they're not and crucially ways that we could improve um, both the current sort of digital platforms and how they're working, but also some bigger, bigger picture questions about more systemic changes that could make the internet economy be more fair and equitable and work for local communities. Ooh, and so, as I mentioned, there was this real running tension throughout the entire project where people felt uh, grateful and excited about the, the positives that come from digital platforms. But as I mentioned, they're always tempered by these negatives, which it really wasn't clear that the positives were outweighing the negatives. In fact, you know, taking a step back now and looking at all of the uh, all of the anecdotes and ex experiences and perspectives that we heard, it's pretty clear that the negatives are outweighing the positives. We found that people are um, very concerned about the monopolistic power that these platforms are having and the way that that is um, disrupting the industries in ways that are not beneficial. Um, this was expressed in both economic and cultural concerns. Participants noted that this sort of manip monopolistic um, hold that platforms have over audiences leaves people with very little choice but to use them because there aren't meaningful alternatives or if there are alternatives they are so small um, that it doesn't necessarily bring the, those same sort of sort of benefits so there was this real tension there and finally we found that you know, these large digital platforms are further entrenching a lot of uh, sort of pre-established power imbalances that, that already existed before, uh, before the rise of the internet and the rise of these digital platforms. You know, as Lizzie sort of uh, touched on, the, the rise of um, Web 1.0 came with all of these promises of um, disintermediation between um, creators and users, being able to do peer-to-peer -peer connecting, being able to sidestep a lot of the sort of traditional institutional gatekeepers, be it major um, record labels or publishers or other, other gatekeepers. But what we are finding is that the digital platforms are actually uh, reflecting, if not <laughs> sometimes exacerbating these kinds of power imbalances. So on that note, let me tell you a little bit about each, uh, each topic that we explored. So Exhibit was our first event and for this one we really wanted to explore the ways that people showcase their work online and the impacts of content moderation and censorship and platform governance. Uh, in particular we were very interested in hearing from sex workers who experienced some of the most harsh censorship online uh, as well as members of the LGBTQ plus community and racially and physically diverse content creators. Um, the findings of this were generally um, pretty pretty grim, to be honest. Um, basically, the running theme was that because many digital platforms, or well, most digital platforms are trying to uh, overlay a global standard for content moderation, it, it's having a homogenizing effect on um, perceptions of morality and leading to all kinds of harms for people who have their content taken down, um, even when it is lawful, even when it is, you know, the, 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 
the whether or not it's harmful is highly contested and so these the harms are, are happening on um, an individual level so loss of income or loss of community uh, on a on a community level where people are unable to share vital health information and safety information and on a societal level where we have this kind of flattening out of culture um, and that real homogenizing effect where um, you we kind of like gravitate towards the average because of this uh, this sort of flattening impact of, of um, global level content moderation policies. And what we heard was that the, the fear, there's this really pervasive fear amongst a lot of people when using digital platforms, in particular social media platforms, that the threat of having content taken down or losing access to your accounts and therefore your online communities is having this really pervasive impact of um, like a culture of self censorship. People are proactively changing the way that they use digital platforms in order to avoid um, being being kicked off or, you know, being shadow banned or, or being censored in other ways. And one thing that came through really strongly in this particular conversation was that government regulation in this space is actually making it a lot worse at, at the moment. There is this real increased trend that is happening at the moment, um, which is pushing for content moderation as a sort of solution to a lot of the problems that are happening online. But the balance is just not getting it right at the moment. And so what we're seeing is with um, pieces of regulation like the Online Safety Act or over in the US, um, SESTA FOSTA, uh, incentivizing digital platforms to do um, even more broad uh, and automated content moderation, which is um, resulting in, in broad overcapture and, and exacerbating those harms. The next event that we did was Imagine, which focused on ways that digital platforms are changing the face of writing and storytelling. We explored issues related to intellectual property and copyright, um, revenue models, and the impact on social media algorithms and trends upon that, that the impact that those um, structures have upon the creative process and how that kind of impacts the kinds of stories and writing that becomes popular um, and that that is successful versus those that sort of fall to the wayside. Uh, for this one, we spoke with academics, writers, artists and filmmakers. And what we found here, as I sort of alluded to before, was that platform capitalism is really recreating and exacerbating these, these existing power dynamics between um, major rights holders, so the publishing houses or the record labels and creative workers. We also found that there's this kind of sense that it's creators versus users. Um, there's, or at least that's a pervasive narrative that kind of gets um, thrown about. And the problem with that is that, well, A, it's a false dichotomy, but B, it also distracts from the, the digital platforms or the major rights holders that are really still reaping all of the benefits, while both users and creators are getting an unfair deal. We also found that the, the chokehold practices, business models and monopolistic practices are really um, leading to a situation where both users and creators feel like as though they don't have a choice and they're sort of trapped within these ecosystems. And so one of the examples we looked at there was Audible um, and the inability to be able to move uh, content that you have paid for out of that ecosystem, which then traps users in there, which then Amazon is able to leverage um, when it comes to the writers because that's where the bulk of people are so that writers don't have the the power to be like well I'll just take my content elsewhere because there really isn't a, a, an, an alternate um, platform that offers the same kind of reach. The third event that we did was Gather which we sort of switched gears a little bit and moved away from the, the sort of more creative side and we focused on uh, community leaders, organizers and activists who use digital platforms to develop communities and build social movements um, and push for, for social change. Um, and a big trend that came out in this one was this real tension between um, the ability to amplify political and social messages and to be able to reach a, a, a big number of people 
while at the same time having to navigate really pervasive uh, surveillance that can arise from using these platforms, which can in turn undermine uh, uh, social movements and, and organizing movements, um, as well as the, the kind of uh, commercial and corporate marketing logic that um, sort of seeps into organizing. And so what we found was because there aren't really uh, purpose-built tools for community organizing, organizers are uh, having to use um, major and mainstream digital platforms and kind of just make it work. And it's, it's not really doing the job. Um, and one of the issues that, that arises with that is that because uh, digital platforms really prioritize a sort of transactional relationship, this can undermine a lot of community building because strong um, social movements are based on strong relationships, um, trust and solidarity. And that's very hard to, um, to do online if you are focusing on things like the marketing logic that is embedded into the structure of these platforms. For example, one of the things that we heard was um, on social media platforms, there's this real emphasis on vanity metrics. So the number of likes and shares and followers and things like that, which can um, actually end up undermining social movements because you get distracted by these numbers that don't necessarily translate to any kind of meaningful action or support um, or impact. And then finally, the last event that we did, which was amazingly, we were able to do it in person. We had planned on doing all four of these events in person, um, but alas, the uh, coronavirus, coronavirus pandemic prevented us from doing that. But we were able to do our final event in person in partnership with Music Victoria, which was really exciting. Um, so this event focused specifically on musicians and the music industry. And we were thrilled to be able to have a uh, performance by local singer songwriter Eilish Gilligan as well, because we figured if we're going to be talking about um, the arts, why not showcase the arts at the same time? And it was a really uh, lovely evening. Um, so in this event, we, we discussed the impacts of uh, streaming platforms and of uh, ex exploitative revenue models. Uh, we talked about digital royalties and how many platforms are either not paying them fairly or in some cases just not paying them at all. Um, and as well as the sort of pressure that artists and musicians feel to be uh, very online to sort of, um, you know, pour their, their personal lives and their personalities into social media in order to, to go viral and build a following and how that's impacting um, the music industry as well. And this one really sort of emphasized how this, this, there was this real promise of disintermediation, you know, this promise that musicians would be able to do, to connect directly with fans, to be able to, you know, be able to produce and, and, and showcase their music without having to go through, um, you know, major media, major um, music labels. But what we, what we have heard from musicians is that rather than uh, removing this intermediary, the traditional gatekeeper of the music labels, digital platforms now act as an additional intermediary. So it, now artists are having to navigate more hurdles rather than less. And on top of that, the opaque algorithms and um, sort of governance of digital platforms makes that even, even harder for them to sort of navigate that space because it's very, it's not always clear how to, how to, how to um, you know, use the algorithm to your advantage because they're constantly changing. Um, so yeah, so that I think is a, just a general overview of what has been a very um, broad and widespread project. Um, we have plenty of recommendations that came out of these conversations as well. And I would encourage you to go and read the actual report, which is on uh, our website now. And we'll put the link in the chat because we did pull out recommendations and um, group them for um, digital platforms themselves, uh, government and regulatory bodies, as well as civil society, because there are, there are, uh, things that all three groups could be doing to improve improve this. As I mentioned before, some of the recommendations are kind of um, on a smaller scale, you know, ways that we could improve the current uh, status quo while operating in this um, sort of 
surveillance capitalism, platform capitalism um, structure. So things like um, better consultation with affected communities and improved transparency and accountability mechanisms and pathways for address for people who um, are harmed by um, when things go wrong and more equitable revenue sharing models and things like that. But then we've also got some recommendations in there which come back to these sort of bigger systemic changes that we really need to be seeing. So, you know, challenging platform capitalism, um, you know, pushing back on chokehold business models and um, un uncompetitive uh, monopolistic practices. And as I've put here on the slide, like the real sort of, I guess, crux of it is, is that global dominant and centralized platforms are just fundamentally not working for local communities. And that is, you know, kind of by their very nature, by trying to scale something to be, um, you know, to work for everybody ends up kind of working for nobody, except for the platforms who reap all the benefits and all the profits. <laughs> and so what we the all our recommendations are really grounded in this, this running theme that came through, was, which was the need for um, alternative platforms, things that are community led, community built, um, and community governed. And so what we really need to be seeing for this in order to happen is for governments to be playing a role in this and in mitigating these, these power imbalances. But as coming back to what Lizzie said at the beginning, this needs to be informed by genuine consultation with affected communities because currently they are not getting the balance right. And so there's vast room for improvement there. So that was a lot. I hope that you will go away and read the actual report um, and the recommendations that come um, out of that, because uh, we really did hear some amazing perspectives from people who are facing this every day. And now I'm going to hand over to James, who is going to wrap us up um, and talk about what happens next. Great. Thanks very much, Sam. And um, yeah, I really uh, appreciate just the amount of work that, that Sam has put into um, into this report and to all of this research, um, as uh, Lizzie called out at the beginning, um, it's been an enormous effort. So thank you, Sam. Um, I'm James, I'm the executive director of Digital Rights Watch. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna quickly talk about kind of where we go to from here as we've heard from just from Sam there. Um, this was an enormous project to talk to as many people as we did and to really get a, a picture of how the internet economy is working for local communities and, and particularly local creative uh, and community groups. Um, and I guess like the short version, as you can probably tell, is that the internet economy just isn't really working for, for local creative workers um, and for our local community builders. Um, these global tech platforms um, aren't really serving the needs uh, that our communities have and are, are doing some real harms. Um, so this project has given us a, a real basis of, of knowledge of that, of really understanding the dynamics of like how uh, communities are being impacted by this kind of these shifts in the digital economy um, and it's really made the case for us that there is a problem here that really does need to be solved and it's really important that we continue to work in this space um, to to develop solutions and develop policies that are going to uh, benefit local communities um, and we really do think that there is a big role for government in this work. Um, we really want to look at regulations and other interventions that the government could be making um, to support the local economy. Um, and a lot of the pressures that we're talking about in this report aren't, aren't new. Um, in the age of broadcast media, we, we know that there were similar problems with local content, um, as well as uh, making sure that like local content creators were served and that local culture and that these policy um, priorities of, of having a kind of local cultural identity and having um, content that serves the needs of our communities. Uh, these were things that the government intervened with. Um, so in the age of broadcast media, we know that that was local content quotas so that um, radio stations had to play a certain amount of Australian music, TV stations had to play and create a certain amount of unique local content. Um, these are laws that we still have. They've been watered down and changed and, and somewhat updated for the digital age, but um, there are still challenges here that I think the digital age um, and the digital economy, we have not solved this yet. Like those, um, uh, we don't have laws yet or policies that really solve the problems that we're now facing in the digital age. But um, I think we look at our history and we've, uh, we've acknowledged that these problems exist. We've acted on them before and I think we've got to revisit those. Um, and the other one that we've created in the past is the ABC um, as an uh, inter 
into intervening into creating and having a, a local content um, or a local TV station and broadcast media station that is able to um, produce content in the public interest for Australia. And I think that thinking about the roles that we've had in the past, we should look at, you know, how can we design um, solutions that look into um, or that, that address the situation we find ourselves in now, which does have a lot of um, parallels to other parts of our history, but also the digital age does present, present new and unique challenges and these digital platforms and just the the size and power of these digital platforms is obviously um, somewhat unique. Um, government can't act on its own here. I think um, Sam pointed this out as well, that we uh, really do need to make sure that the people who are impacted by this are at the table and are being consulted. That means creative workers. Um, it also means the communities who are impacted by, by any of this. And so we do wanna make sure that um, as a member of civil society and, and uh, as a group, as an organization, Digital Rights Watch, we've developed a lot of great connections with people throughout these communities while doing this project. And we wanna continue to work with them to make sure that they're involved in uh, developing kind of proposals and solutions to these problems as well. And so that government is acting in their interest because as Sam mentioned, some of the, the content moderation approach and the censorship approaches are just not working um, for, for local communities. Um, so for us, the next steps is we really wanna build on this research. Um, this report was made possible by a grant from the Internet Society Foundation, and we wanna, um, we're seeking more funding to continue this work. Um, we think there's, uh, the next stage of this work is going to be uh, thinking about uh, taking everything we've learned about the problem and starting to really develop and, and test different solutions to how we can, what kind of regulation, what kind of other government interventions could we make? Uh, what kind of civil society interventions could we make to help solve this problem? Um, there is a lot of great thinking that's already out there. Um, some of you uh, may have already encountered this, but um, we would love to examine uh, ones, the, uh, an organization from the UK called Commonwealth. Um, they did a report into the Common Platform, um, which is an interesting report looking at a publicly owned digital platform and whether that would be uh, viable. Um, there's also a, a book um, recently released by Ben Tarnoff on the internet for the people. There are a lot of people who are thinking about this problem and like how do we get the internet to work for the people uh, in the public interest um, and not for um, you know a handful of giant digital tech companies like uh, tech companies and digital platforms um, as it currently does. Um, and we think there's room for some cre you know in creative and um, original thinking too. Um, we think Australia is a really interesting case here. Um, we want to have solutions that work for Australia. Um, and, you know, we think that Australia has a, an opportunity to really innovate um, in protecting our local industries here. Um, we have a, a history of doing that. And I think that, um, as Lizzie mentioned at the start, the uh, news media bargaining code was deeply flawed and we had a lot of critiques of it, but it was also exciting to see the government have a go at trying to regulate this space. <laughs> um, and despite our critiques of it, um, I think that um, it is it is heartening to see uh, the government having a willingness to take on these platforms on behalf of local communities and local industry. Um, so that's the next step for us is that we're gonna continue, or we're really excited to continue this work um, and digging into how we may be able to um, address some of the problems that we unearthed through this research um, and what kind of role the government could, could play. Uh, so with that, I think I'm um, just going to wrap it up. Um, maybe I'll pass back to Sam to send us send us on our way. Um, but we have got a um, the I posted in the chat there the link to the report. We'd love for you to have a read. Um, we are going to be doing a, a public launch of this report soon. So this is just our little preview for people who were involved and for supporters. Um, but um, yeah, I, we would love to get your thoughts on the report as well. And um, yeah, looking forward to. The, the conversation that this this kicks off. Thank you. Uh, Sam, do you want to, is there any I other housekeeping say if, or are we done? If, if anyone here does have any particular like questions or thoughts that they wanted to share now, more than happy. We've got a little bit of time, otherwise we can wrap up early and you can you know, go and get a cup of tea before the next thing or something. But if anyone has any questions, feel free to speak up now. Otherwise we'll wrap up, wrap it up. And thank you so much for being here. So it looks like, um, there is that one Ooh. question there. Oh, yeah. Um, I always can forget you to look at the Q&A. Yes. <laughs> okay. 
I, I can see an update that says James Clark is going to answer this question. Live. Oh, I, I, I just pushed the button. I, I'm not used to this. Let's <laughs> committed you to a course of action, man. <laughs> um, so the question um, for people who can't see the chat there, do you think it's true that we cannot have nice internet um, prosperity for arts and culture living under corporate capitalism structures and gatekeeping? Um, Sam, do you want to have a thought about that one? I feel like uh, you have a thought about that one. I mean, so something that came up a bit in this, we had a, fr a few speakers actually who would um, essentially like tell us about the horrors of, of trying to, um, you know, create work and promote it and sell it and, and, and whatnot. But then, and, but then be like, oh, but you know, we're just, you gotta do what you gotta do in capitalism. <laughs> um, and it was, which, which I think was, is like a really shared kind of, experience and and dilemma right because a lot of these issues do come back to the like underlying um business models of these platforms which are inherently um capitalistic so yeah i think that's a it's a real challenge i don't know whether it's necessarily as um uh like black and white as like yes we can or no, we can't. I think that there are way, there are certainly some of the things that we learned from this is that there are ways to improve the current uh, dynamic under our current system of, of platform of, of capitalism. I do think though, yes, of course, like a lot of the sort of bigger systemic um, changes that we need to see would come with challenging um, capitalist structures and and um, some of the things that came through especially in discussions about creativity and art were that um, one of the things that people are really concerned about is the way that these platforms are actually kind of uh, leading to a culture of like commodifying creativity and devaluing um, artistic expression and artistic work. And so, and then that kind of goes hand in hand with capitalism really, because it's not productive. Um, so yes, not a satisfying answer, but I, I think that there are some really big, big problems there. Did you have anything to add, James? <laughs> um, no, I think that's a good answer. I, I was also thinking something that came up during the, um, I've forgotten the name of the music one. Was it Create? Yeah. Yeah, during um, Create, our in-person live one, uh, we had a lot of discussion around um, the just the commodification of art. Music's a really interesting place where you don't really buy music. You buy a commodity. You buy a, a CD. You buy an MP3. You buy access to a streaming service. Um, and I think thinking a bit about the way that uh, the role that art and music plays in our lives under capitalism is it's treated as a little product, as a commodity that needs to constantly be, you know, you need to constantly be producing new products in order to, to continue to live as an artist. And I think that that does diminish the role that art and culture plays in our lives and, and how important it is for our communities. Um, and so I do think it's worth thinking about, um, obviously, we a lot of fantastic art has been created under capitalism, that's obviously true. There's a lot of brilliant art that gets created all the time. Um, but also thinking about the role of art in our lives and in our communities and how it can bring people together, how it lets us share experiences, how it lets us um, build a sense of collective belonging with each other. Those are, are also really important roles that music and art play in our lives um, that do push up against capitalism in a way that like often that that kind of role is extracted from it so that you can create products i guess so i think that um i think that art would be better without capitalism but <laughs> i think we would all experience it better but um obviously um yeah that's going to be a, a real a real challenge um which i think actually probably leads us on to the the next question from paul um um, how much of an impact do you think Digital Rights Watch can have? After all, you're up against some very large and powerful organisation um, organizations. Facebook giving the finger to the Australian government um, back around the pay for news controversy comes to mind. Um, yes, great question. <laughs> um, I think obviously we are going up against some very, very, very powerful players. Um, I think one of the interesting things in Australia is the... Um, is that I think the Australian government hasn't been completely bought out by these platforms yet. Um, so I think there is some room for us to, to manoeuvre here um, and think about what 
um, you know, what can what what solutions can be implemented in Australia um, that uh, can create alternatives here. Um, I do think, you know, the power of the state, um, you know, at the end of the day, Facebook didn't get everything it wanted from that and go like they they went the, they did the nuclear option of pulling all news from their site um, and they still didn't get everything they wanted from that negotiation they still were forced to pay local publishers um, I don't think that they would be enormously happy with that outcome like I think they would have rather avoid that um, and so and I think that the public wasn't really on their side in that either so I think while Facebook absolutely will you know and all of the media digital platforms will likely play quite dirty um, in this fight um, and they are very powerful. I do think that we we have cause to be optimistic. And I also believe that, um, you know, there's no point being fatalistic about it. We have to start somewhere. And I think that, um, you know, where um, if not us, who, who else is doing <laughs> So um, that's, you know, we've got to start somewhere. And so we're gonna, we're determined to, to fight on that. Um, does anyone else have anything to add to that answer? I think you nailed that one. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk about NFTs right at the right at the end? <laughs> go. Do you want to have a go at NFTs? Sure. Just... So, so the question is: Do you have any thoughts on movement towards NFTs, or do you think art ought to be shared as a public good? Um, <laughs> NFTs only came up a little bit, surprisingly, just not that much throughout this throughout this project, I kind of anticipated that it might, they might be proposed as an alternative way for, you know, artists to be, um, you know, uh, controlling ownership of their work or, or getting payment and things like that. But they really didn't come up that much. And I think that a big reason for that is that a lot of artists and creatives don't want it. Um, and because it's, you know, a lot of people are very well aware of a lot of the challenges um, and ethical issues that, that arise from NFTs. Another thing that I think is really, um, at least to me, is, is important in this kind of discussion is really coming back to this obsession around ownership. Like a, a lot of the people we spoke to are actually like, yes, they want to have um credit and have you know be be accredited for their work but there really wasn't this sense of a need to be like really fixated on this is this is my unique image or, or whatever like it, that that felt kind of um it was pretty far removed from what um what artists seemed to 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 genuinely want and I think that yeah there's some sort of obsession with ownership is not necessarily helpful when it comes to um, the, the benefits associated with art and um, creativity. So did you have anything to add to that, James? Uh, no, I think that was, uh, I think the, just kind of what I was talking about before around the um, decommodification, de people that we spoke to in this, uh, were, yeah, definitely weren't looking for like, we want more ways to own our work or we don't want you know new commodities we want to decommodify our art and be able to live in a way um by you know producing art that works kind of for themselves and for the communities that they're producing art for um and so yeah it really didn't come up and if like and when it did most when it did often come up in passing it was often dismissed as just not you know a, a further push towards commodification of art was the opposite of what a lot of the people we were talking to in this project really wanted um, um I said that Lizzie's gone off video, but I actually thought Lizzie would be a fantastic person to answer this last question about the ACCC. Are you still around, Lizzie, or are you have you had to run away? No, I'm definitely here. I'll just put my video back on. I was doing a um, nappy change. Um, so what I <laughs> what I was going to say, um, I saw that question about the ACCC as well, and I thought it was really interesting. I mean, I think one of the things, uh, you know, I'm a lawyer by training, and I'm I'm always interested in the ACCC because. Um, in some ways they are empowered to do interesting work because they come at things from a perspective that accords with the capitalist framework. You know, they're, they're trying to work out how to make markets function better. And so, um, you know, I, I'm pretty... Uh, 
uh, I've also noticed that in some of the commentary, particularly around the news media bargaining code, that um, you know Rod Sims is perceived internationally, who is the former head of the ACCC, as being uh, a pretty forthright regulator, prepared to take on big tech platforms, and has gained a reputation for doing so. I mean, he's he's left now, so that may change. But I'd be surprised if it if it does. I think that um, the ACCC has kind of got a taste for these kinds of things, and they are in a position where they're trying to make markets function better, and there's, there's clearly some market failure to be addressed that means that they can be um, reasonably bold. The question is, will it always serve the communities that we're discussing here today that we've tried to give a voice to in this report? And I think that is still a bit open. I mean, they are about regulating markets, not necessarily making um, uh, or not necessarily interrogating where there's a conflict between, say, democratic ideals and market functionality or um, or even, you know, uh, how you support um, industries like the arts that aren't necessarily that don't necessarily work well in a market economy anyway. Um, and so I think there's a real role to play in, in providing some of this complementary research to the very extensive work that the ACCC has been doing on, on digital platforms and their outsized power. Um, and I just hope that part of what we do is with this regulatory impulse that it's not just confined to ideals of market functionality and that in fact we start to bring in um, more um, expansive yeah. concepts like democracy like the capacity to organize human rights but also creativity and supporting creative communities um you know the the act the privacy act for example is currently undergoing a review uh, which was one of the recommendations of the ACCC report yeah. and um that's something obviously digital rights watch is quite keen to participate in and i think that's got implications for this as well because you know part of the reason why these the internet economy isn't working for lots of these people that we've been talking about is that it's data driven and that it's about creating engagement and uh that's how money is made in the current internet economy and so privacy i think and how it gets reformed will be a big part of that and i guess that's another that's an example where the um there is a regulatory impulse from wow. the current government we know that the the key um catalyst for this kind of potential changes come from the ACCC but I would hope that through the work of civil society organizations like Digital Rights Watch and others that uh, more expansive ideas of reform and what potential exists for the internet to work well for more different types of communities and people will that opportunity will be taken rather than it, it being um, a, a slightly more narrow-minded vision of, of market functionality which I think is just um, doesn't cut it for the problems that we're talking about today. Um, so I think that there's scope, but um, the ACCC is doing a job that it's been assigned to do, which is not necessarily the same job we're trying to do with this report, and that's a good thing, and that's why we need more of this kind of research and collaboration and engagement of civil society and communities um, and giving them a voice in this process so that we can make the most of, of this next period of the internet's history uh, and turn these um, concerns people have into real change, um, turn that into a... a, a form of reform that really works for everyone and not just small sections of society. Cool. Um, thanks, Lizzie. Um, I, uh, we're, we're now over time, so I think we should probably wrap up and respect everyone. Um, great questions, time. by the way, I think, yeah. as well. So I'm really grateful you took them. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I did have to answer one in the um, in the chat. But um, yeah, if um, thank you all for, for coming and for asking these fantastic questions. And I'm excited to see this is going to get cited in someone's PhD. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I believe uh, that's probably, there's no more housekeeping that we need to talk about here, Sam. So I think we can probably wrap this up. Um, the re link to the report is in the chat um, as well. We really do encourage you to go have a have a read of that. Um, and thank you very much for, for coming along and, and hearing about the, the project that we've been working on. It's been great to see you all. So thanks very much.